20 years, I see a global Bitcoin standard. I see Bitcoin acknowledged uh, globally as money. And now you realize, oh, wow, my earning potential isn't keeping up with this sort of inflation and decrease in my purchasing power. I don't want to have Bitcoin to have a bunch of money. I want to have Bitcoin because I want to have time. There'll be no use for fiat in 20 or 30 years. Once you feel that and you feel that you can really inhabit that true freedom fully, there's no reason to go back. That place is a jail. If I have enough Bitcoin, maybe I get the premium package and live 500 years. In 20 years, a Bitcoin standard, Bitcoin as a medium of exchange, Bitcoin will deny dominate commodities contracts between nation states. I think it'll be a unit of account for products at a high level and probably in the grocery store as well. It's interesting to me how quickly it happened. It took 10 years for every human on the planet to just have this on them at all times. The five regrets of dying are... How did death bring you to Bitcoin? Sure. So um, my professional career has been as a owner and operator of one of the U.S.'s largest crematory mortuary uh, locations in the country. Um, I did that for about 10 years, basically from 2013 to 2023 and serving about 5000 families a year. Uh, I had tons of experience with uh, the bereaved and those who are at end of life. And where we were in the market, we charged a lot less than other folks. Um, so we got a lot of families anywhere from very poor to very wealthy. Um, but I saw within my job a unique perspective on society, which was how do people think at the end of their life? And I was one of the few professions that actually got to see the regrets and pains and grief at the end of life, especially for patients who were terminally ill. And I had the opportunity to talk to a lot of people on their deathbed uh, and with hospice workers. So hosp I don't know if they have it where you are, but hospice is a specific type of medical care reserved for the terminally ill. So if you're on hospice care, the main goal is comfort and quality of life before you pass away. And usually people pass away on hospice within six months. So, you know, dealing with grieving people and dealing with people who are about to die, I got a lot of insight into kind of how people graded their own lives. So were people happy with their time on earth? Did they feel they spent it in a good way? what was really important to them at the end? And did they have any realizations at the end of their life that they wish they'd encountered a lot earlier in their life? And what I found was that most people's biggest regret in life is living a life that they thought they should live rather than living a life that was more authentic to themselves. And I saw it repeated over and over with my clients and it didn't really matter what skin color they were, uh, what their values were or whether they had money or not. The biggest regret they have was not living a life that was true to themselves. And after selling our business, I got very interested in economics, the fiat system and how money worked and how how capital flowed across the world. And after learning more about the debt based fiat money system and that bringing me to Bitcoin and understanding Bitcoin's attributes and how it fixed a lot of those issues, I looked back on my professional career through the lens of fiat money and seeing all the families that I helped who were grieving struggled to pay their bill, adding financial constraint to an already very emotional time. I, I thought the culprit was a lack of hard work or just a bad breaks and bad luck among this group of socioeconomically disadvantageous group of people. But after understanding Bitcoin, I realized that 
a lot of that was simply out of their control due to money printing, robbing them of their purchasing power little by little over decades, ultimately getting them to a point of near retirement and them not having really any money to save or to spend in their retirement or to take care of medical bills or to take care of a one-time emergency of a, a few thousand dollars. So Bitcoin really made me understand how our society got to that point where people couldn't get two coins together to really save for expenses. And it also taught me that the fiat system was the basis for people living lives that they didn't want to live. Society basically programmed them to plug into a corporate role as kind of a mindless factory worker without really any thought behind it. And that, that's what that's a thing that really had me disconcerted when people live their whole lives in a job or in a career and they get to the end of it and they really don't know why they started there in the first place and why they never pivoted and did something that they actually wanted to do. And what I found was I think people are really scared of the unknown and they're scared of not having that salary that really kind of keeps them in that fenced in area. And therefore they really never dare to dream and never get, dare to go outside that. And you see that pain of regret at the end of their life. And that that's kind of how I got to Bitcoin because Bitcoin to me is the best way that you buy your future and you buy all, you buy as much of that time back for yourself as you can to give yourself as much freedom for the longest amount of time as you can on a Bitcoin standard. And to me down, when you go down the rabbit hole, which is one way you really figure that out and there's no other option and there's no better alternative other than Bitcoin. I love that a lot. Um, Wow. There are so many things that I want to get into because first of all, you said that like 5,000 families or so like 5,000 deaths you dealt yeah. with or are dealing with per year. Yeah. Um, also interesting. Um, I think a lot of people at the end of their feared life, they discover that they have more years to live than their savings, which is yeah. a very sad thing. Uh, because those were not those were hardworking people that did the right thing in the fiat system, but they, yep. they never discovered that they got screwed over, um, which is a very sad thing in to begin with. Um, and it's like this this fiat system kind of makes you fearful because it keeps you in this this loop, and you have to get better, and it, it never gives you a brief room for you to discover what and what what do I really want to do. Right. Uh, so it's it's interesting how you discovered that. Yeah, it, you, the, you kind of talk a lot about the matrix and the fiat system being the creation of the matrix. And I really found true to form that most people are compliant with the matrix. And it does cause some aggravation, frustration and uneasiness in them. But without Bitcoin, there's, there's no end in sight. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. There's no prospect or game that you can play that can get you out of this matrix. Everything is forcing you within it. And, um, and until you see Bitcoin or a better sound money, you know, you know nothing else. And everything in the world that you see on a screen or in the news is going to keep you in that mindset, to keep you in the system, to keep it going. Do you think, uh, I mean, that's uh, always hard to say, but do, do you think that's kind of the design or is it just accidentally that that fiat system grew and now it's like we have that system and we it's it's just maintaining itself because uh, it kind of kind of got out of out of hand. i think that it's it's possible that it was designed um and i think if if it was we would never know who um and i think more easily uh and more obvious the incentive structures that have been created around the the system of money and corporatization are really good incentive systems, paying people good amount of money to be in the system, to do that job, whether it's 
copywriting or being on an Excel spreadsheet, turning Excel files over, um, whatever it is, it provides a salary so that a person can have a family and live a decent life. But I also think that that goes or feeds into kind of the hypnosis of that process as well and make someone complacent um, about their career and about their life, which, which I understand because if you, if you do have a job and it is paying you well and you can support a family, if it's not broken, don't fix it. But that also leaves you open to times in the macro environment where there's a lot of money printing. And if you don't understand how the system works, you see you, the inflation kind of nabs at your heels faster than you can outpace it. And it comes at you fast. And that's really the only way that people's eyes can be opened to the issue at hand. And that's really happened in the last four or five years with our generation, I think, you know, with inflation up nine, 10% a year. Um, and over the course of four, the last four years being up maybe 30, 35%, everything was fine until the fiat system es escalated and accelerated into this time. And then now you realize, oh, wow, my earning potential isn't keeping up with this sort of inflation and decrease in my purchasing power. That, that's the kind, that opens the door to understanding the system more and Bitcoin as a solution. That's how it happened for me. I, we sold our business and I had money from the sale. And while it wasn't, you know, anything like micro strategy, I still wanted to preserve my cash. And that's how I started down this rabbit hole. Um, even after losing money on Celsius where I got burned, I doubled down in my education on Bitcoin and then gained a ton more conviction. And that's where I put a lot of my money. Why, why did you uh, have so many other questions? But uh, in that point, it's, I think it's really interesting. Um, why did you double down? Like you got burned a lot of people when they got screwed over. Uh, I also hear like in the early days in Austria, especially around the 2017 time, there were a lot of scams going on. Uh, even yeah. I was uh, almost in one of those scams. Yeah. Um, just by luck, I was not in there. Um, and a lot of people, when they get into something, they get screwed over. Celsius was a, a ma major thing. There are like 50 other companies at the same time that also <laughs> screwed people over. FTX, uh, BlockFi, all the other uh, yeah, companies that screwed people over. How, why did you go deeper? Why did you not say, oh, it's a scam. I, I don't want to do anything with it. I had, at that time, I had a pretty, I had grown some pretty steep, distrust in the general institutions, um, but specifically healthcare, because I was on the front lines with COVID, with my business, dealing with healthcare and death and dying and the vaccines and everything like that. Being on the front lines and being the person that has to deal with the effects of COVID and an abnormal amount of death going on around the world and, and in America that directly affected my business and being told a narrative about that that wasn't true and finding out that it was deliberately kept from uh, the citizens, that grew a real spark of distrust at such a critical time, which then kind of sparked my interest again in macro and geopolitical economy. And so I said, if all of these crypto things are failing and the media is telling me that it's all a scam and grouping Bitcoin with crypto and making sure that it's very clear from mainstream media that it's all a scam not to be touched, not to be engaged with at all. Don't worry. We're telling you the truth. You don't need to engage with this entire space at all. I said to myself, I'll do my own research, which is a very common phrase in Bitcoin and, you know, on X, you know, do your own research, whatever that means for you. Um, so that's what I did. And I had the time to do it because I, we had sold the business and 
I said, I'm going to put myself in my own independent study and learn as much as I can about the Federal Reserve, the banking system, the World Bank and the IMF. And once I did my own research, I came to an even higher conviction of Bitcoin than when I'd first got into it just for a number go up. So I think it really just stemmed from an overall instinct of distrust for, for the system. And rather than get angry about it, I just decided to read and listen to podcasts and found you and, you know, other YouTubers that were very even keeled, not hyperbole. Like there was no hyperbole in what you say. There's no exaggeration or sensationalism. I wanted to find people that just spoke the truth that they had discovered or people that want to bring you on their journey of discovering. And I did that myself. And that's really what led me to double down over time. I gained conviction and then kept learning. And as I kept learning, I just went deeper into the rabbit hole and became more of a Bitcoin believer with every day. That's, that's really how it happened. So it was gradual for me, but it went in one direction. I love to hear it. Yeah. And I, and I think it does something beautiful with, with finding people like my podcast with other sources, with books and everything like, because I just try to find the truth out about life, find the truth out about the guests. Why is the guest thinking like he is thinking? Mm. How is he thinking? What is he thinking about? There's like the things I want to figure out. Uh, and with that, I learn a lot and it's great that people can learn through my lens and can get along my journey. Uh, but like the, the podcast I will do all my life because I will don't, never want to stop learning from other people. Uh, and you also have something interesting uh, with the healthcare system um, because you were also on the front lines. Obviously, I'm in Austria. Obviously, the healthcare system in Austria is, is different than in, uh, in the yeah. States. Uh, but most of my fuels are actually in the States, like 50% of my fuels in, are in the United States. Um, what's from your perspective, from your uh, unique view, what's wrong with the healthcare system? And do you think that thing that is wrong would also be wrong on a sound money standard? It's a great question. I, I think what's, what's wrong with the healthcare system is uh, the relationship between healthcare providers and insurance companies. And insurance is a fantastic business. Uh, you basically get paid monthly for a promise to pay for something if it happens. And then if that thing happens, then they work relatively hard not to pay you for that thing. So as a business, it's very advantageous to large insurance companies. And they've lobbied very successfully over the last several decades to make sure that they are a critical mechanism in the system of healthcare and the machine of healthcare um, so that they can't be extricated and taken out of it. So I, I think, and, and I'm sure that, There are some insurance companies that are good and do right by customers, and that's fantastic. But as an institution overall, I think it's pretty predatory generally um, and hard to deal with. Um, a lot of red tape, a lot of paperwork and things like that. So, And there, there's, there's not an incentive system to make people healthy at the source of health. You know, um, our, our entire medical system was developed with pharmaceutical drugs, and many of them are great. However, I think that there should be a mechanism where people can get cheaper drugs offered to them, more fairly priced, um, as well as natural methods supported by the healthcare system. Uh, the healthcare system in America is very geared towards prescribing you a pill as quickly as possible to solve whatever ailment you have. And I don't think that that makes Americans healthier overall. And I think whether that's on purpose or not, I don't know. Um, but it seems pretty obvious that that's how the healthcare system and medical sales and pharmaceutical sales are, are set up is to sell pills to doctors who can prescribe them to patients. I don't know if it 
goes away on a sound money standard. I think that the incentives for insurance companies would certainly change on a Bitcoin standard. I think that there would be an incentive to have as impactful medicine, natural or otherwise, to get a patient better as quickly as possible so that they don't have to return to the healthcare system with chronic illness. Um, I think that would be a good outcome. And I think it would be at least possible on a sound money system rather than mm. kind of perpetuating as much illness for as many fiat dollars as consistently as you can, which seems to be the case in the current healthcare system. It's always interesting for me because when, uh, when I look at medicaments as an indication, how sick you are, <laughs> Uh, it's like if, if the less medication you take in a year or in 10 years in whatever time frame you look at, um, probably the fitter or the more healthy you are. And I'm really, really inclined to not take medication as yep. long as I possibly can. 100%. Like even when, when I'm at the doctors and I'm feeling not well, which did not happen for a long time, but uh, when it's the case and he prescribes me something, I'm asking him at least two times, do I really have to take this? Mm -hmm. is, is there any other way? Could I wait another week? Can I just wait uh, like a few days? Maybe I don't need it. Maybe the body takes care of it. Like I always make sure to take the medicaments as a last exit point. As in, yeah. oh, I'm, I'm so bad. The, my body cannot handle it on their own because medication saved a lot of lives. Like uh, yeah. we, we, we should, we should also cover that side, but uh, we, we came to the point where we just like put, <laughs> put, put a bandaid on and it's okay. We don't have to fight the symptoms. You, you hit your toe every day in the morning at the same desk, keep hitting them by our prescriptions for painkillers. Yeah. Like that, that's exactly. basically our system. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, exactly. um, uh, that, that, that's, I think something bad. I, I also have no clue about if it goes away from the sound money standard. That's why I keep asking my guests. But I think uh, it, it will be at least a little bit better, uh, I feel like. Is the health insurance, because you mentioned that, optional in the States? Or do you have to get health insurance? You, ha you have to get health insurance in the U.S. I mean, there are certainly people who don't. But with Obamacare, they really want to um, force you into a, any healthcare provider that they can. And if you don't, then they will certainly highly suggest that you do. Um, I've, I've never not had health insurance. Medical bills would be crippling if you didn't have health insurance and you had any accident or developed a chronic illness. It would, ban it would bankrupt most people if you don't have insurance. All right. Uh, and Austria is also not, like in Austria, I think it's, actually not possible to not have health insurance. Yeah, I think yeah. it's, it's legally just not possible, but there is also private things, but most are like, it, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty okay in, in Austria uh, for my, uh, for my feelings. Um, back to the, your job, basically, what are the main regrets? You touched on it a little bit with the life, but what are the main regrets that you usually heard? It's a really nice perspective that you have, and it's really nice that you have this this, this la grieving and this last perspective on, on, on the system and on the people. And what would you say is like the, the main thing that you usually heard? And, uh, was there something in there that surprised you or some, some story yeah. that you can share with us? So the, the five regrets of dying are, I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. That's number one. Um, number two, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Three, I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. Four, I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. And five, I wish I'd been happier. So what I, what I see in those, um, and I like to, for number one, living a life true to yourself, I really like to bring up Jack Mallers, the CEO of Strike. He talks a lot about, you know, early in his career, not going to college, like dropping out after a semester, diving deep into Bitcoin because it felt authentic to him and look where he is now. So he, he's, he talks about his time on this planet being finite and really understanding how that should shape 
what you do and the action you take professionally and romantically in your life. And that's really refreshing because as a Bitcoiner, he gets that life is not infinite. We're not immortal. And he took the action young to live a life that was true to himself because he knew his time on planet Earth was finite and wanted to make the most of it and be as fulfilled as he could be during his time. And I think you doing that as well, you know, diving deep into Bitcoin, doing the podcast, you, your effort is following your passion very closely. And that's a beautiful thing for human beings that only those who do that experience. And you, I, I can, I'm can, i sure that based on your maybe the last six or 12 months of what you've been doing, you've gained so much momentum by having that mentality that you couldn't go back to a different nine to five lifestyle working for someone else, right? And that is really what this regret is getting at. It's the life that you dream of when you hit the pillow at night is actually possible for you. It's that you don't truly believe that you can do it. And there's so many incentives around you keeping you from doing it that you remain complacent and spend every day living the life that you don't want to live, further entrenching you into the life that you don't want for yourself, which is why at the end of your life, it's such a big regret that on your deathbed, you really understand what life was about and realize that you might not have lived as fully as you could have. And that's very difficult for people to accept. And often, if they accept it at all, it's not until very, very late or too late, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I find that with all these five regrets of dying, Bitcoiners tend not to have as big issues with these because they find tremendous amount of freedom in the Bitcoin standard. And there's proof in, in that purchasing power growing, giving them more time freedom in the present moment to do the projects that they really feel are meaningful and important to their families, their lives, and the work that they want to do on earth. And I think it's interesting because um, when we come to Bitcoin, when we come to money, um, the biggest thing we can reclaim, the biggest thing that we get back is time. Yes. Like it, it, it does not, I, I don't want to have Bitcoin to have a bunch of money. I want to have Bitcoin because I want to have time. And the mm -hmm. five regrets that you talk about, like spending time with family, with friends, being yeah. happy in life, being happy is like, it's a thing. Like if, if, if you do things that make you happy, you will be happy. Like if you, yeah. if, you if you do more things of those. So it all kind of comes back to time. Also like the first one, I wish I had the courage to live a uh, life true to myself. Th that comes back to time. If, if you yeah. are in a nine to five uh, and you have to work like 40, maybe 50 hours a week doing something that you really don't like yeah uh, because you have to pay pills and then you cannot even save anything above that like if if you have to go through a season like five ten years in your life where you have to just grind and you get a lot of money you can save something yeah. th that's maybe fun like that's like there are seasons in life where you work harder there are seasons where you don't work as hard that that, that like don't take this as an excuse to not do anything. <laughs> don't be lazy. Right, right, right. right, right, right. Uh, put, put your proof of work in there. But um, try to get to a state where you have the time to do what feels right for you. And I work, uh, like, as you brought up my uh, example, I was uh, before employed uh, and I loved it. I liked it. Like, I was happy there. But yeah. once I saw the the grass on the other side is even greener, uh, like they had that window in like podcasting and Bitcoin and this world of, of amazing people that I can interview, there was no going back. Like I started in November uh, uh, podcasting and I was employed till uh, March. But okay. even in January, I was like, oh, that's <laughs> it's no question I, I will do the other thing full time it was just a question of when do i make the switch right. because once you see the other side once you see the green grass on the other side you're mm -hmm. like i'm not going back to there uh, so so th this is a this is a big thing i feel like and that what you what you felt was the pull of true freedom and and 
once you feel that and you feel that you can really inhabit that true freedom fully, you're like, well, I'm never, I, there's no reason to go back. That place is a jail, you know, as nice as it is, it's like a jail. And the money part is interesting because I still to do this day, I don't earn as much as I earned before per month. Sure. I'm coming closer and closer. I'm almost there now, but it does not matter. Like if you just like, this is the first thing, like if you can pay your bills, if you, mm -hmm. if you have enough money to pay your bills, your life is fine because yeah. then you can pay your bills. You can stand up every day and do whatever you want to do. And this is such an amazing freedom. You can go out in your life and go on a Tuesday morning to uh, animals and do the zoo and just enjoy yeah. life. Yeah. And yeah. then maybe instead of that, you work on a Sunday. Like that, that's yeah. your decision if what you right. want to do. And it's your consequence. And it's your, yeah. like, if, if you do, don't do anything, you will not get money for that. Uh, yeah. But it's your decision and your, con and like, that's something so powerful. It has to do little to do with Bitcoin, I feel like, because even on a Bitcoin standard, I feel like people will be in a nine to five enslaved because yeah. uh, they they did not uh, do too much work. But it does a lot with your brain when all of a sudden you can save money in in the your fin in in a sound money system where your financial energy is safe in there. Yeah, really cool. Yeah. Perfect. Then, uh, yeah, this was, uh, this was really cool. I kind of got off, off topic here. No, I really enjoyed <laughs> uh, it. Uh, how, how was, um, how did Bitcoin, would you say impacted your, your personal life? Did, did this something happen in, in, in your life that you, that it impacted you? Bitcoin specifically, I think Bitcoin, Bitcoin gave me a lot of hope after, after we sold the business. I didn't have, I had an identity crisis personally, because all I'd ever been was a funeral director going in, working 10 hours a day, talking to families in their most vulnerable days of their entire life. And it was always an environment of high emotional volatility. And that was the only thing I was used to. That was the kind of lifestyle I was used to because of my career. And then after selling the business and doing my independent study on Bitcoin and realizing all of the aspects of Bitcoin that allowed you to really preserve your purchasing power and therefore buy your time back, I started easing up in life a lot more personally. And I think it was just my mentality towards life changed on a Bitcoin standard. As I accumulated Bitcoin in a DCA strategy, I gained more confidence day in and day out about my future. And I'd never experienced that with work, making any amount of money, or the only thing that I think that I likened it to was fit, a personal fitness journey. As you, As I put the work in, For a personal fitness journey, I see the results in my body. I felt that with Bitcoin. As I gave more to Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin gave more to me in terms of philosophy and perspective about how life should be lived. And I think that is that can only come from an understanding of sound money and what you can do with your life on a sound money standard. And also the ability to choose that standard for yourself today, which you're allowed to do, but some people don't um, or are afraid to. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin, keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your Bitbox. And if you really want to bulletproof your self-custody setup, your security setup, and maybe even your citizenship set up you have to talk to the bitcoin way if you go to the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash robin you get a 30 minute free call 
where you can dive deep with them if your self-custody setup is secure, if your citizenship is secure or maybe might be improvable, or your digital footprint in general is secure. They are the experts in cybersecurity, in Bitcoin self-custody, and how to be a secure, sovereign, individual in general. And for those of you who are in search of a new Bitcoin exchange where they can buy their Bitcoin from, I recommend my personal Bitcoin exchange 21 Bitcoin. With code Robin, you get a hefty discount for all your purchases in the future. Really cool. And what are you now doing with, with Bitcoin? You also have to sign like Bitcoin for Dummies, uh, yeah. which is a fascinating name. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's like yeah, not, so not Bitcoin I, for beginners, but for dummies. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, you were an inspiration for me there. So I wanted to kind of, you know, on a lot of podcasts, the hosts and their guests always say like, what are you doing to contribute to Bitcoin? And I'd been a consumer of Bitcoin content for a long time, gaining momentum, gaining my own conviction. And after hearing you and other podcasters talk about what they do, for the community by having unique conversations, posting unique insights and analysis and all those sorts of things, I wanted to contribute myself. So I started an X Bitcoin BTC for dummies and started posting there a few months ago, kind of just breaking it down, anything regarding information, analysis, quotes, um, tracking the ETFs, which are really big in the US now, and I think a very big narrative as we continue the bull run. So I just kind of wanted to be a source for information, but also for myself, have a journal of what's going on right now in Bitcoin, because I think in three years, all of this is really going to be valuable history that we'll look back on as, you know, OGs. And I didn't want it to kind of slip out of my hands. So I use my Twitter as something to keep track of current events and what's going on as we reach a more critical point in Bitcoin's evolution that seems to be building up quite quickly in 2024. Mm, I love it. What, what I like, uh, <laughs> what do you give, think so, so far of 2024 with uh, Trump, with halving, with ETFs and all the things that are going on? Yeah, it's crazy. And even more with, you know, you, f you follow enough mainstream media and you kind of see how news articles will come out um, about different people being introduced to Bitcoin and they kind of, the, the news headline comes out and you kind of bookmark it and then you check back three or four months later and then that person comes out as pro Bitcoin and you kind of see this evolution of people discovering Bitcoin and you kind of just put a bookmark there and then wait four to six months and they're Bitcoiners and they start posting about Bitcoin. They put laser eyes on their profile picture on X, you know, and it's, it seems to be gaining momentum and it's, it, you, I just can't ignore that anymore. And more, the more and more prominent people, especially in the U S which I follow most closely are, coming out as Bitcoiners and they'll, they'll kind of give you a Hansel and Gretel like trail of breadcrumbs of what they're thinking until they do a real announcement. But it's just been fascinating to, to be interested when I was and follow it as closely as I am and see how this Bitcoin fire is spreading and it's uncontainable really. What, what's your what's your long term vision with with Bitcoin? Uh, when you see now the, the fire and it, it's kind of starting, and, and there's so many exciting news already now. What's your long term vision for Bitcoin? Where do you see it like in twenty years? Twenty twenty years, I see a global Bitcoin standard. I see Bitcoin acknowledged uh, globally as money. Um, I think uh, fiat will still exist alongside of it. I think it might take longer than 20 years for fiat to go away if it goes away at all. I know there's some people a lot smarter than I am that say there'll be no use for fiat in 20 or 30 years. 
I've adopted a Bitcoin standard in preparation for that, but I don't know for sure because I think that the power of a digital fiat currency is hard to overlook because there are very powerful institutions making sure that the fiat system doesn't fall by the wayside overnight. And I don't want to discount those forces at play. But in 20 years, certainly a Bitcoin standard, Bitcoin as a medium of exchange, I think Bitcoin will denominate commodities contracts between nation states. I think it'll be a unit of account for for products at a high level um, and probably in the grocery store as well. Where that permeates, I can't say for sure in 20 years, but I think definitely the Western world and most of the prominent uh, Eastern world as well, I see that happening. Um, And a general acknowledgement of Bitcoin as pristine money and pristine capital. That's really what I see. I often ask um, 20 years because I'm kind of writing now on a thesis for 2044. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's interesting to see what can happen in 20 years. I think a lot of people completely overestimate what Bitcoin will do like in the next one to five years, but they completely, absolutely underestimate what Bitcoin will do and the Bitcoin mm-hmm. development will do in 20 years. That time frame is so interesting this 20 year like even 10 years is amazing what what can happen mm-hmm. in 10 years but 20 years is like a lot of time uh, especially with technology especially with bitcoin yeah. uh this this will go much faster than uh, m- most think uh, with the bitcoin standard so with global adoption yeah i think so too your your conversation with fred krueger uh, that you had i think helped validate a lot of my thinking on the macro scale for the next, you know, 10 or 20 years, you see AI blockchain technology with Bitcoin, robotics, gene editing with CRISPR technology and and DNA manipulation. All of those technologies are in their infancy or just exiting their infancy in early stages. And they're all technologies that propel each other and have synergistic uses. So when he said in your episode that, you know, we're going to be living in a completely sci-fi world, I really agree with that. And I, I think life as we know it will change very drastically in the next 10 years. And I don't see a way around it. Right. I, I see all of these technologies really dovetailing on each other and creating a new society that's almost unrecognizable to even what we have today. And I'm interested to see how it plays out, especially till, you know, the next five years, I think you're going to be wild, but the next 10 to 20 are going to be, I think, even more. And I think Bitcoin is the money layer of those changes and will become the base layer of the new world after that that transition. I truly also think so. And it's interesting what implications this then has. Like what what are the consequences of having some money, having all this great technology, getting cheaper mm-hmm. over time, creating abundance in some sense. Do, do you think that we we can venture in an abundance system where uh, people don't have to worry uh, about future bills because electricity, energy, mm-hmm. uh, food and everything that we need for living is just so, so, so cheap to buy because we have robotics, we have AI, a lot of things that uh, are just previous were done by humans or done, done now by robots, for example. Uh, and also with gene editing is also interesting. Do you think that we come to a point where we just live way longer, like a few few hundred thousand years ago, it was yeah. unthinkable that we get like to like 80, 90, 100 years. Maybe we get maybe to a stage where we get 500 years old or something like that. I think I think it's uh, I think it's possible. I I follow gene editing because I have a certain type of leukemia where when my DNA replicated, one piece broke off and attached to another piece. So I follow gene editing very closely because they work with 
chronic illnesses like mine as some of the first solutions for CRISPR. And I, I see a world within 15 years where I get a gene therapy and I'm totally cured of leukemia. And if, if, if I have enough Bitcoin, maybe I get the premium package and live 500 years, you know, I, I see that kind of potential happening or even some sort of downloadable consciousness happening as well, where, you know, with robotics interfacing with your brain, you may be able to actually harness consciousness and transfer that consciousness as data into different carbon beings. That that's kind of a possibility in the next, you know, several decades. I could see that happening. That would be totally in line with a very sci-fi world. So the gene editing, I think, will tackle chronic illness first. And I think that's the best way to do it. And then it'll come for, you know, genetically editing newborns for a certain eye color that may just be kind of as simple as choosing what paint or stitching you want on your car seats. I don't know. So it, it depends kind of where we get to and how much access the public has to that technology, given how cheap it may become. This is interesting. I had, I had one guest on, um, he has a really complicated French name. Uh, I can not even pronounce it. Jean, Jean Francais, something like that. Um, and he basically went on the show and he said like gene editing is the most dangerous right now we can do to human species. Like full disclosure, I have no clue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have no clue about that uh, at all. Uh, but he brought some interesting points on like uh, he, he compared it to the bees, how the bees kind of edited themselves to be this queen leading species uh, and that he kind of fears that that could happen also with gene editing by humans, that there's like a centralized authority who has then control over how to edit the genes of all the, the humans and then also with newborns and kind of we try, we, we kind of go towards like an uh, a worker bee uh, thing kind of a future it's it's an interesting thought uh, i have no clue like if it's actually can happen like that uh but gene editing and transplant uh, and and also like with neuralink it's also like yeah. goes in a similar direction where people yeah. who cannot see all of a sudden can see again like that's amazing that's worthwhile right. Right. Uh, innovating for yes yes it's, it's a, I think currently, I don't know if it's good either. And I, I'll agree with you there. I think that the very clear path for these medical technologies is to make them digestible by helping people who need it first, which normalizes the technology among the people who don't have access to it. And then af over the course of a generation or two, it's those people's grandchildren who now right on the newborn table get edited or whatever or inoculated with nanobots or something like that and it just is a passive normalization of these technologies but it's hard to under it's hard to know if it's good for humans right if if this transition into kind of transhumanism where robots are human and human are humans are robots kind of early on. I think we might live to see a world where that's the case. And I think from my perspective, someone who's only lived as a pure human, I don't know if that's good for humanity. I don't know if, if I see my grandchildren or great grandchildren become cyborgs at the age of two, I don't know if I'm going to be uneasy with that, like, like giving a current, like giving a kid a cell phone at eight years old, you know, is that too early to give the phone to the child? Can they actually wield this power or is it going to hack their dopamine system and create problems for them long-term with romantic relationships, concentration, focus, um, reading the written word on a page? Like, are these things that are, should be preserved as humans as a way to develop before you give or unleash this technology on young people. 
right? And how to how do you kind of gauge the philosophy of giving them these powerful tools versus withholding them and letting them mature before their use? So I don't know. I don't know the answer. I don't know what's right. A cell phone is interesting because like we we, we always kind of have it. Uh, mm -hmm. We always kind of have the, the cell phone uh, with us. Uh, yeah. And this is then already kind of a, a cyborg yeah. future where you are half robot and half human. Like when <laughs> earlier, when, when like before we had phones, when there was a uh, discussion on the table and we talked about like, oh, but that's how that and that's how that. But now it's like, oh, we, we just Google it. Yeah. And now even worse, or even better, <laughs> however you want to see it, we can just ask ChatGPT. I have ChatGPT, the premium thing on, on my phone. Yeah. And when like I have some some weird feeling in my body, I'm like, hey, ChatGPT, I feel that in my body. Uh, yeah. Is that concerning or what can that be? And it's like, just list everything. It's like massive. It's 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 like, oh, okay. And then it's like recommending, oh, like just wait one, one day. And if it's still there, like you can go to the doctor and stuff like that. It's like, um, an actual good help or like, Hey, uh, I have those five things in my fridge. What really delicious thing can I cook? Can you give me the yes. exact recipe and how can I make it as healthy as possible? Like that's, yeah. th that's something really, really cool. Yeah, it is. It is. And I think, I think we're, we're in the beginning stages of, of that with as humans. And I think it's only going to get better. Right. And I think that it'll be integrated with all robotics as well. So track uh, Tesla a lot and any every robotics company that I can and kind of see how the development of humanoid robots is coming. And they're still relatively primitive, but compared to 10 years ago, they're unbelievable. Like the Tesla Optimus bot has the dexterity to fold a shirt. Right. It's not crazy to think that it could look in your, it could be your robot in your home in 10 years, looking in your fridge and chat GPT is in its head, making the recipe and then it's making the meal for you. I mean, it, it's, we could, we, I see, I see that as the future and I don't know what humans do in that future, quite frankly. I, I hope I hope a lot of creative and productive endeavors. We have to keep the proof of work alive. And if we get too sedentary and too disengaged with how easy and pleasurable life is, it could be the beginning of our end. <laughs> That's this funny thing. Like when when you thought about AI and robotics uh, in the early days before ChatGPT and everything came out, you thought that oh. Uh, I can focus on great work. I can make music. I can write stuff. Uh, and robots will do the dishes. Robots will do the laundry. And now it's like, no, 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 no. AI is doing the creative work. AI is doing <laughs> writing the te writing yeah, the yeah. text. AI is is doing all yeah. all the music and stuff like that. You're doing the memes, and you are doing the laundry, and you it's are doing the dishes. Joke. It's a cruel it's joke. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's cruel joke. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard, it's hard, it's hard. <laughs> but it's I have an interesting story to share because sure. I, I mentioned my phone. Um, I had before an iPhone 14 Pro Max uh, mm -hmm. that I did not need. <laughs> uh, the Bitcoin standard living uh, on completely Bitcoin and being self-employed, like you really watch your money going out and in and you have to pay taxes for everything. Uh, like if you are an employee, the employer pays the taxes for you. You don't have to even think about it, mm -hmm. but then you have to pay about taxes and stuff like that. And this all kind of came to me and I was like, wait, I have this phone that I use for what? I use it for Twitter, <laughs> writing tweets. Uh, and uh, I use it yeah, for nothing else, honestly, like writing on WhatsApp and, and phoning with people. I was like, why do I have an iPhone 14 Pro Max? Two weeks ago, downgraded to an 11. I, oh. I, I, I went back 
I had the yeah. 11 before. I upgraded last year to a new iPhone 14 Pro Max because I felt like, ah, I need a new iPhone. Yeah. What's the newest iPhone? Let's buy the newest, yeah. best iPhone. And, mm -hmm. and, and a few weeks ago, I was like, I don't, I don't need that. I, I rather sell my current phone, get an old phone, a really old one. The only thing I put a new battery in there. So I have no problem with the battery. This was the only important yeah, thing. Fantastic. And I got Bitcoin for that. And I'm already looking forward to the future calculations in like 10 years, how much money I made downgrading to a phone that that phone is still too good for me. That yeah. that phone is still too good to just write tweets, and I just yeah. wanted to to get this uh, this this story up. It has no um, a relation direct to our conversation, but I feel it's like it shows it, it shows what Bitcoin does with you. Absolutely, you know, you 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 saw the arbitrage in your phone to stack more sats at the most critical time to stack, right? You know a lot of people would say like these are the real last chances to stack as much as you can before things go go crazy i mean i i, I took i went through i moved and while i when i moved i was looking through all my stuff and i had clothes that i hadn't worn in three years different different like uh woodworking equipment that i wasn't using and i went through it all and i said i'm selling this stuff as much as i can because i have I don't need it. I want more space, and I'll take whatever money and buy Bitcoin. For the that that seemed like the easiest trade in the world to me, right? I, I have I think I have the same issue. I have a I think fourteen Pro Max actually, but and it's way too much phone, way too much phone. And I don't what I don't like is it's hijacked my brain, right? So. I find myself during the day bringing it with me from room to room. And I, th and I say to myself, like, I just leave it in that room. I don't need, I, why do I need to, why do I need to touch it? <laughs> but my, but, but Robin, my hand, it's automatic. It turned automatic, right? Your brain just grabs it, unlocks it and goes to an app, right? Just for that little dopamine shot. So I'm trying now to leave it at home when I walk my dog leave it in a certain room. I don't need it. Leave it charging in my bedroom while I'm out in the kitchen cooking and playing with my dog to get myself more, more me time rather than cyborg version of me. But, you know, it's very it's well really designed to hack your neuro, your neurological systems. It's really rare that I have it actually with me here. I usually I don't have it here. Uh, I have a specific place in the house. It's in the hallway where I also charge it. Uh, yeah. And it's like actually 90% of the time, it's just laying there uh, because I don't need it. I, I look there like, oh, what, what did someone call me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because yeah. everything else is on my computer anyways. And I find like when I'm on my computer, I'm not as distracted. I'm, I'm not like scrolling uh, on Instagram or something like that. On my phone, it's um, like nowadays I work so much that I don't even really have time to scroll. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like the like because I have such a high workload, uh, it kind of took care of the scrolling addiction because I just don't have there time for yes. scrolling these days. <laughs> yes. Uh, um, so that that proof of work is is a healing thing for 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 any addiction that you have because you just simply Absolutely. don't have time for your addictions anymore. Uh, so yeah, but th th it's great to, to have the phone just laying outside and the phone should be what the phone actually should be. The phone is there to have, um, your computer with you when you're traveling. Th that's it. Like that's if, it. If, if I'm out and about, uh, oh, I can quickly check messages or oh, I can do things. And, uh, sometimes it's good to not have your phone with you at all to, to have, have this me time, as you said. I usually always have it with me uh, to check <laughs> check my my YouTube's and check my Twitters. It's, it does not make sense, but I have a better feeling then. Uh, but but it's uh, it, it's funny how, how how we are integrated with that device so so much. But yeah, that's uh, that's really it, cool. It's it's interesting to me how quickly it happened. Right, it took ten years for every human on the planet to just have this on them at all times. 
right? It's pretty And now pretty think wild. about Bitcoin adoption. Yeah, 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 actually, and that's exactly why I think hyper Bitcoinization is possible faster than a lot of people think, because this is the infrastructure for hyper Bitcoinization, right? And it already exists and is proliferated throughout the world or a, a lot of the world. Absolutely. Uh, man, it's it's such a pleasure to talk with you. Uh, oh, thank really you. cool. Fa fa thank you for being on the show uh, already. But we are uh, not at the end routine already. Um, one question before the end routine, the question that I always ask my guests these days, what can we learn from you besides Bitcoin? I think that if I had advice for people, it is you only get one life as far as you can experience. Do not be afraid to take the action that you think and feel is right and true to you in your life. No matter how scared you are, do it. So if there's anyone out there who's listening and that resonates with them, this is your permission to do that thing and become the person that you know you want to be. I love it a lot. Um, perfect. <laughs> We are having now the end routine, and I, I think that's like uh, we, we talked about that in the, in the podcast already. Like that's so important uh, to to be actually the, the the person you want to be. Um, even though I always add in here, like there are seasons to life. Like uh, mm -hmm. go 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 through hardships if if you really need to. Um, I think that's that's an important message also. But it's yes. it's really important to in the long run get to your truest self. Yes. Um, Now the end routine where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest. Do they a special one? Because the the uh, previous guest asked three questions okay. <laughs> uh, that are all kind of interrelated. And I want to give it to you one by one. So one question, okay. one answer. Uh, yeah, sure. Because it's really interesting also how they stack up. And I'm interested in what you say. Um, first question for you of the free end routine question. What does freedom mean to you? Freedom, the ability to spend my time, which is my most precious resource in the ways that I deem most productive and fulfilling and fruitful in my life. That's beautiful. Second questions building on that. Do you consider yourself free? I'd consider myself 90% there. I think the last 10% I'm still working towards. I, 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 I am extremely grateful for the freedom that I have. I think that the last bit for me, find a way to monetize my, my Bitcoin journey, which is a longer road for me, just given my current work constraints and time. But that's my, that's my last goal for freedom. I need it almost one and a half years before I made the first euro, but I was not that um, that uh, serious about it in the beginning. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it, it took me a long, long, long time. But yeah, that's it's really, really cool. Last questions. What steps are you taking to protect your freedom? It's a really good question. Living on a Bitcoin standard protects my freedom. And I'm also the next, within the next five years, I want to have some sort of jurisdictional freedom with uh, international residency. Um, that to me is a big pillar of freedom for my long-term future. Um, just having lived in the US for the last 10 years, there seems to be some sort of fracturing of the social contract between humans and some lack of respect between of humanity between people due to ideological beliefs that they believe are incompatible with their neighbor. And that that worries me. And I'd like the freedom to be able to go to a place um, that doesn't have that as a worry. So my, my next step and last step is jurisdictional freedom uh, as much as possible within the next five years. Will, it was such an honor and pleasure to talk with you. Thank, uh, you, thank you for being on. Before I let you go, where can people find you? Where can people find uh, your stuff? You can find me on X at BTC4Dummies underscore. Post Bitcoin updates. Bitcoin education, interesting quotes that I think capture the zeitgeist of Bitcoin, 
um, ETF updates and stuff like that. Uh, DM me, say hello. I always like to meet Bitcoiners. Um, trying to put as much time as I can into this space because it's just has some of the best people on earth in, in this industry and it attracts really good spirits, human spirits. And I always willing to talk to a Bitcoiner about anything. So you can find me there and appreciate you, Robin, for doing what you do and diving in head first into this. You're doing a fantastic job for, for everybody. So I really appreciate you too, man. Thank you, Will. Thank you also for everyone watching and listening, uh, for, for being here today and joining us today. Uh, and I'll be back as always tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.